So this lesson is about the Hardy-Weinberg and tying together basic genetics with the use of Punnett squares and how inheritance affects evolution um, and looking at it at a smaller scale but within a population. So um, to start off with one of the warm-ups or one of the questions I had asked in class was how many of you can roll your tongue and I know in one class I have 30 students, um, eight are non-tongue rollers and the other 22 can roll their tongue. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to sort of use that data um, to work through the Hardy-Weinberg and, um, and talk about what exactly the Hardy-Weinberg is, okay? So um, to start off with, the Hardy-Weinberg is looking at an entire population and within that population, can you figure out how many are going to be homozygous dominant of that population, how many individuals are going to be heterozygous, and how are many are going to be homozygous recessive. So in our case right over here, we clearly have eight individuals, uh, oops, there we go, we have eight individuals that are little r, little r. But of those 22, we don't know how many are big r, big r, and how many are big r and little r. And we can use the Hardy-Weinberg to actually figure that out. So let's go through some definitions first, okay? So we need to deal with allele frequency. In, in other words, how often is there a big A in a population versus a small A? So in our example of having eight uh, tongue rollers, non-tongue rollers, we know for sure those eight are going to be little r, little r. That means we have 16 guaranteed little r's in our class population. How did I get 16? Well, if there are eight individuals, each of those eight uh, donates two, so I multiply by two. But we don't know how many big r's there are. And we can figure that out um, using that. But having said that, we know that um, an allele frequency is how many of these r's small r's there are in a population versus how many big r's there are. The other thing for Hardy-Weinberg is that it's a way to see whether or not a population um, will change because we're assuming that if the number of individuals have little r, little r changes over many generations to be a different number than it was in the original, then some sort of evolution happens. So in other words, populations of organisms will not change or evolve if the allele frequency in the population stays the same. So if you always have 24 big A's in a population and 12 little A's, then you know that if it's the same after generation and after generation, no evolution happened. So no evolution if you always have the same numbers of big A's and little A's. And this is what we call a population that is in genetic equilibrium. That means it is not evolving. So a couple of principles for the Hardy-Weinberg. Um, there must be random mating. That means that not one individual is preferred to be mated with than the other. A population has to be very large. We're usually talking in the thousands. There can be no movement into or out of a population, so no new members can come in other than just births, but no, nothing from outside someplace else, and no one can leave. There is uh, no mutation that the DNA doesn't get any strange uh, changes, and there's no natural selection. In other words, one type of organism is not able to survive better than the other. Everyone has an equal chance. And um, we can do this with humans, but mainly it's done with any sort of other uh, living population. And for the steps of the Hardy-Weinberg, just very briefly, um, we need to determine what our P and our Q is, and then we're going to write the equation, calculate, and make percentages. And I'll go into steps of exactly how to do this. So um, as I had said in class, we know we're going to assign the big A as our P value and our little a as our Q value, okay? And if I have, um, in my example, um, I have here a pool. And let's say I have two big A individuals. So we have a total of five individuals. And then two other individuals that are big A, little a. 
and then one individual that's little a, each of those individuals is going to, in the gene pool, we're going to assume they're donating their allele. So this one is going to donate two A's. This group is going to donate two A's. This individual is going to donate an A and a little a. This individual is going to donate an A and a little a. And this individual will donate two A's. So that means that in our gene pool, we have six big A's, more or less there are six here, and four little a's. And all of those would equal up to 100% of all of these alleles. And we can write that a little bit differently. What we can do is we can say, okay, if I add all my big a's and all my little a's in that pool, I get 100% of all the alleles that exist in this population. We know that a is going to equal p, so let's write instead of a, p, so that means all the dominant alleles, Q is all the recessive alleles, equals one whole population, the entire population. So we simply make those in percentages. If we have six out of all of them, that's 60%, which we can make into a decimal of 0.6. Here, we have four out of all 10. That works out to be point four as a decimal, when you add those two together, you have the val value of one. These are the allele frequencies, okay? So that's what I'm looking for whenever I'm talking about allele frequency. So point six is the allele, P allele frequency, and the Q is point four. So that's the first step, okay, if we need to find allele frequencies. So now there's another scenario where let's see what the genotype frequency is. So we're going to look at that a little bit differently. And we're going to erase the whole screen. So for this one here, what are all the possible genotypes that we can have in a population? Well, we can have big A, big A in a population. We can have big A, little a. We can also have little a, big A, and I know we never use that, but that's a possible combination. You can have little a, little a. So those are all the different types of populations we have. So we're going to see if we can rewrite this. And the way that we're going to rewrite this is replacing our big, our letters with, um, with Q's and P's. So in this case, we can say that we have P squared. We have two A's, yeah? And here we can say we have Q squared. So that take care, takes care of these. And it's just more or less two of them. For this one here, this is going to be unusual, is because we have two sets of these. We're going to say this is 2PQ. I have one, two of them looking like that. We are not multiplying those. So our Hardy-Weinberg equation actually works out to be this. P squared comes from the fact that you have two A's side by side. We call them squared. You have two of them. We have two sets of PQ's, so that's why we put a big two here. And we have two uh, A's next to each other that we call that uh, Q squared. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this formula to figure out how many um, we have of each of these. How many big A, big A's do we have? And that relates to this here. That's our big A, big A. And how many big A, little A's we have? That's that one. And how many little A, little A's we have? So what we're going to do is come up with the equation. So let's say we have 64% of our population is a PTC taster. And remember, that was that strip of uh, very bitter tasting uh, that you tasted. And some of you didn't taste it. But let's say in a population that we're looking at, 64% are PTC. So the first step we need to do, as I say up here, is we need to determine our P and our Q. It's step number one. So we use the P plus Q equals one. So how are we going to do that? Well, we know that this is a dominant trait, so that 
can either be big A, big A, or big A, little a, which means that 36% have to be little a, little a. So we're assuming that you have a population of 100. We'll make our life easier. So we know that 36% are going to be little a, little a. So how can we figure out our Q? So this here we know is Q squared, right? Because it's little a, little a. Can we find Q from this? Sure. All we need to do is get the square root of 36. That's how we're going to do it because we want to get Q by itself. And Q equals, and we'll do the square root of 0.36, equals 0.6, correct? So in that case, our Q value equals 0.6. I know from my last slide that P plus Q equals 1. So that means if I know that the Q value is 0.6, that goes here, then my P value must be 0.4. All right. So now I know that P equals 0.4. So now I'm going to take these two numbers and simply plug them to the equation. So if I want to find my big A, big A, I simply go, okay, it's just P squared. So I take 0.4 and I square root it. So that means that I have 0.6, or in other words, 16% of my population is big A, big A. For the next one, I plug in the numbers. I have 2. My P value is 0.4. My Q value is 0.6. So when I do this, I have uh, a number of 0.24. That's 48 times 2. That means that the number of individuals that are big A, little a, are 48%, okay? And lastly, from before, I don't even need to calculate this, I know that my Q2 value, or in other words, my little a, little a value is 0.36%, okay? And when you actually do this calculation, in case you have to calculate it, we know the Q value is 0.6%. And we square root it, it gives us the same thing. This should work out to add up to pretty close to 100%. That means that 16% of my population should be big A, big A. 48% is going to be big A, little a. And 36% is going to be um, little a, little a. So now what would happen if I say, well, my population isn't 100? How many, if I have a population of 200 individuals, so I have here 200 uh, individuals in my population, if that were the case, how many of those 200 would be big A, big A? So I know that out of 100, 16 out of 100 are big A, big A. So how many would there be out of 200? Well, 200 is double the amount of 100, so I just multiply it by 2 to get 32 individuals, okay? So that's one way that you can do those as well. And that's the Hardy-Weinberg equation.